in the middle of the days, the countdown to the day of Pentecost. So I thought we might go over that just a little bit and talk about something related to that today. In Leviticus chapter 23, verse 15, is a scripture we've had read back during the days of Unleavened Bread. Depending on how long you've been around, um, you may have read it a bunch of times before. But in Leviticus chapter 23 and verse 15, it says, And you shall count unto you from the morrow after the Sabbath, from the day that you brought the sheaf of the wave offering, seven Sabbaths shall be complete. Today is the fifth Sabbath toward the countdown to Pentecost. Now this period of time, as it says, from the morrow after the Sabbath begins that countdown. There were two major harvests in Palestine. The first one was the grain harvest. But no grain could be harvested until after what is called the wave sheaf offering was handed up. Now, most of you, again, have heard this explained. I won't go into that today. That's not the purpose. But the wave sheaf offering had to be completed before you know, that could be done, before any other harvest could take place. But, you know, the harvest metaphor itself is very, very strong throughout all the teachings of Christ. In these 50 days, we're on the 35th day today, represented the harvest of the first fruits. Jesus Christ, of course, he being the very first of the first fruits. Turn over now, if you would, if you want to turn there, I'm just going to be there for a moment, to Luke chapter 10, verse 2. Christ, again, in speaking to his disciples, he said, Therefore he said unto them, The harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Pray you, therefore, the Lord of the harvest, that he would send forth laborers into his harvest. Then following that, not exactly in the same order, um, but Christ told to his disciples over in Matthew chapter 28, which is sort of the keynote scripture for today in Matthew 28, beginning in verse 19. He said, go. Now, what does go mean to you? Usually at a, like a track race, when they say go, now they shoot a gun in most cases, um, I was very much involved in track field growing up. Uh, but go means get out of the blocks. Go do something. Go run down the track. Go win the race, whatever it is. But it says go, you therefore, and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. And teach them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always even unto the end of the world or the age, depending on how your particular version translates that. In effect, what he said was, go and make disciples. Teach them then to obey all that I have taught you. Now, you're talking about the entirety of everything we have in effect in the Bible. When he said, go and teach them all things. But the emphasis on these days should be in our minds in a parallel to what it meant to the ancient Israelites. It was a time of harvest. This is a time to begin to harvest disciples. Christ said, go and make disciples. Some time ago in a magazine I used to take, I read a story of a pastor who had aroused a lot of curiosity among not only his congregation, but the town as well. He had a, a little bit of speculation going on concerning him because his habit every afternoon was he walked down to the railroad tracks which were not far from the church and at 2 35 p.m. every day unless it was a little bit late a freight train would go roaring past there the pastor would just stand there and watch the train go by until it had completed its journey then he turned around and would go back up to the church now, some of the congregation in the town begin to wonder, you know, what, what's he contemplating? What's he thinking about? Is he going to step out in front of the train? Uh, what's he doing? Uh, so they're a little bit concerned about him. So someone finally approached him and asked him, says, you know, what's with this, this daily walk down to the train tracks and watch the freight train go by? His reply was, I just need to see something that would move around here that I didn't have to push it. <laughs> so evidently his congregation was not doing a lot on their own. How about us? How about us? Does someone else have to push or pull or coax us 
into doing something? Or do we maybe take the horse by the bit, as it goes to say, an old saying, and do it ourselves? And in conjunction with that, are we on fire at the very other end of the spectrum for the Word of God? <coughs> Looking specifically at these words in Matthew 28 that we looked at earlier, go make disciples. Now, some of you will know who this man is, some of you won't. Woody Allen was a comic from many, many years ago. He once said that 80% of success, success is just to simply show up. Now, in, in effect, that really doesn't work that way. But is that maybe the way that we sometimes think? Do we think if we just show up at church or wherever it is that we're going, that the opportunities that abound for ministry will come our way and then we can just respond to that particular situation and then we have in effect accomplished the commandment given to us by Christ in Matthew 28. Because see, he, sure, he gave that commandment, Matthew 28, to the disciples, the 12 who were alive at that time. But that was a message for Christians of all ages right on up from the 12 disciples, right on up until today, and for here on after. Now, I don't think this, but I want to ask you this. Is that the way that we think? That we've just, you know, if we show up, then we'll respond to whatever we need to do, and then from there on, we're, we've done all we need to do. I, I don't think so, and I don't think you think so either. But I also think that we may sometimes underestimate how much that we as a person must do and have in the form of individual initiative as opposed to always letting somebody else do it or waiting for someone to ask you to do it or waiting for someone to push you into doing it or whatever it may be. It is very deeply involved with each individual taking an initiative on their own. In ministry or in any form of evangelism within the church, that is true. The opportunities for ministry will come. Opportunities to, of course, ministry simply means serving, doing something where we are serving in that regard. There is perhaps no aspect, however, of ministry that requires more initiative than what I feel personally is the prime directive given to us as Christians. And that prime directive is go and make disciples. God did not cause, call us necessarily to just save us. He called us to use us. How well are we responding to that call? We as people of God who are called by His name, in other words, Christians, that we are called for that purpose, to make disciples. What demands in your mind, if you think about it, more time, more energy, and more preparation? actually doing a job, or on the other hand, teaching someone else to do it. Which demands more? If you've ever taught, then you understand teaching. Because in order to teach, you've got to know what you're doing, number one. Number two, you've got to prepare for it. And then you've got to take the initiative to get these people moving along that line. So we are there, we're here, in effect, to be taught, in one sense of the word, how to do more. It's not a matter of fact of just you know, doing it. We've got to have a game plan. We've got to have something that we're planning on what to do. There's a lot of preparation involved in it. And it's axiomatic that we as Christians in our life, we're going to have some difficulties that come from time to time. We won't have everybody raise their hand and give their testimony right now, but everybody in this room at one time or another has had a difficulty that they had to go through and maybe, or maybe going through one right now. There's, that is an axiomatic, you know, statement on my part. The life of a Christian can be difficult. There are things that come along that we have to put up with. But beginning with these very first 12 disciples, handpicked by Christ, of course he had to replace the one, we know that. Right on up to until today, we are, we are in charge of doing that in our life. We live today at a time when persecution is rampant in this world. Evidently, persecution of Christians is becoming even greater in other parts of the world. And, you know, we live in somewhat of a 
cocoon in the United States. And even more so, I can remember the years gone by when we were at Ambassador College. And you're talking about living in a cocoon, living away from reality in one sense of the word. And that was some, not something that was necessarily encouraged, but because of the atmosphere and everything else, you felt very isolated and away from a lot of that stuff because you didn't hear about it, you didn't see it, you, didn't, you, know, didn't be, you weren't involved in it. But society today is getting very difficult. I don't have to tell you how many situations are going on in the United States right now that are very unfavorable to those who take a Christian approach. And I don't see it getting any better anytime soon. But at the same time, you and I have that instruction, that directive to go and make disciples regardless as to the persecution we might run into, and regardless as to the government interference that might come along. But life can be just difficult. We all have, at times in our life, certain pulls of the flesh that come our way. We have certain weaknesses that we have individually. But yet at the same time, overcoming those is difficult. But our bigger challenge, in one sense of the word, in my opinion, is to teach and train others how to follow Jesus Christ, to make disciples. Assuming we have a game plan, if you individually are doing something, and that's a big assumption, and that we have the knowledge, then we have the initiative or the drive to do it. There's another big assumption that came along that Christ had to put up with. In Mark chapter 9, verse 33, he said, And he came to Capernaum, and being in the house, he asked them, What was it that you disputed among yourselves by the way? But they held their peace for the way they had disputed among themselves, who should be the greatest? You know, 12 guys trying to decide who of them should be the greatest. And he sat down and called the 12 and said unto them, If any man desires to be first, the same shall be last of all and servant of all. He took a child, set him in the midst of them. When he had taken him in his arms, he said unto them, Whosoever shall receive one of, su receive one of such children in my name receives me. Whosoever shall receive me receives not me, but him that sent me. You know, over the years, and I don't see it near as much as I used to, that was a problem within the churches of God. People were jealous of other people. Somebody wanted to be the one that in years gone past, if they were listening to some type of a message that was pre-recorded, they wanted to be the one to push the button. That was a big job. You can find out it's actually split congregations before, believe it or not. Um, but this was something that Christ had to deal with even with his disciples at that time. Something that comes naturally to us as, as individuals, as people. We, we have rivalries. We, we work together. Now, if you put it in the right context, it's good that we're sort of offsetting one another and urging each other on to do the very best that we can do. But these things come along, and as you have probably experienced or seen in your lifetime, people who simply don't know how to work together with other people or let other people do things when they want to do them, has actually split churches. I don't need, I think, to, to list to any of you the number of church splits that have, uh, have occurred over the last, you know, you name the number of years. But they, that's what has happened. Okay, the next thing that we need to do is to be prepared. Now, I'm not going to ask you the question, are you prepared? But in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15, the scripture says, study plainly just says, study, to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needs not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So it's pretty clear that what he meant by this was, study the word of truth. There's where our knowledge comes from. There's where all things come from. And following up to that in 2 Timothy chapter 3, the next chapter in verse 16, it says that all scripture... And these are scriptures that every one of you have heard numerous times before. Nothing new. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. It's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness. And then the following statement is made. That the man of God, i.e. you and I, may be perfect and thoroughly furnished unto all good works. This is how we prepare ourselves. We have the Bible. We have the book, you know, sitting before you, in some cases on your computer, your telephone, or wherever it is you have. 
Um, didn't have those years gone by, and everybody's got their Bible on their, on their, their cell phone. Um, but the, the, the situation is still the same. Are we studying to show ourselves approved? Are we studying to rightly divide the word of truth, to be preparing ourselves when opportunities or situations come along that we need that preparation, we need that knowledge? Scripture over, I think it's 1 Peter in 3, verse 15, says, be ready always to give an answer for the hope that lies within you. I've had people tell me, well, what do I say when somebody asks me a question? I don't know what's the question. But, you know, at the same time, if we're not studying the Word, if we're not putting our nose into God's Word, when God answered Solomon at the dedication of the temple, his prayer, one of the things he said was, seek my face. And that simply means, put your nose into my Word, put your nose into my laws. Because there's where knowledge comes from. That's where your preparation is. It's the same true for us today. The study of Scripture equips us to be proficient in every aspect of the work that we might do, including making disciples. But if we don't, we're not going to be prepared. We can't spend our time any better than we can in studying God's Word. I think we've all seen how much division, how much dissent there is in every aspect of the world. The world is constantly in struggles and wars, rumors of wars, knowing I'm not predicting the end, the coming tomorrow, or anything like that. But it's, it's a difficult world we live in out there. This pandemic has not made it any easier. Are we prepared for these difficulties as, as they came along? You know, there were hundreds, if not thousands, of churches that as a result of the pandemic or as a result of government intervention in their situation quit meeting during the pandemic altogether. Uh, I know of one person who is using a church that they're renting from someone else. The people they're renting it from, their denomination, has been shut down. They have not met one single time since the pandemic first came out in what, like February, March of, of last year. They've not met a single time. And there are other churches, in, in, of course, in, in California, what was going on there, they were basically kept from by the government from attending and going. But things like this are going to come along. Are we prepared for things like this when they come? Do we know what we're going to do? I've been extremely happy and, and proud and everything else you might say of our congregation here and our willingness to continue to meet as much as we could, do everything we could, but yet at the same time be safe and be you know, taking care of ourselves and asking God to protect us. Um, but if we're not working to be prepared, we never know what's going to come along. And you can't make all of a sudden preparation that should have taken days or weeks or months or possibly years even. You can't do it overnight. You can't decide, I've got to go home and read my entire Bible tonight, find the answer to that question. We've got to prepare and do it before we need it. It must be accomplished ahead of the time that we need it. And the third question, or the third thing that we need to be aware of, is we need to exercise our gifts. Now again, I'm not going to ask everybody to stand up and give a testimony as to what, what their gifts are, but God has given each of us gifts. You may or may not know for sure exactly what your gift is, but everyone who hears this message, whenever they hear it, they have at one time or another dreamed about what they would like to be. I was listening to one of the NFL players that was drafted in the draft the last couple of days. Um, talking about, he said he had always dreamed. He had written and had a picture of it when he was in eighth grade that he wanted to play in the NFL. Now, did he get there by just writing that out on a piece of paper and wishing he would make it? No, you don't do that. To get to where he was, you put out a lot of blood, sweat, and tears to get to the, that particular position. If we want to be prepared for whatever God sends our way, we too are going to have to be prepared. We're going to have to stick our nose into the Word of God and rightly divide that truth. You know, all of us are basically wired the same way. We start life off as a child, as an infant, and everything is given to us until such time as we're able then to maybe reach out and take some of it, but before that everything was given to us. But when we start yielding ourselves unto God and let God flow through us, 
and utilize those gifts and those talents that he has given to us, that's when life really starts working. That our circuits are really alive and responding. And the lights turn on and everything seems to be working right when we're prepared and working to be prepared. How many of you know what this is? Anybody's ever seen one of these before? It's a sponge. It's my work sponge to washing cars. Okay. Anybody ever used one before? You probably have. What is a sponge best at? Soaking up liquids, right? But then what happens once you've soaked up too many liquids? It's super saturated. It won't soak up anymore. So what you have to do is you have to take that sponge, and I don't have anything in here. I thought about filling it up before I came in and having a bowl, but you've got to squeeze it. You've got to wring it out so it will again pick up liquids. That's the way we are sometimes in the sense that we become so full of things that we're doing in life. Life is so busy, we don't have time to do anything else. We're going from more than eight to five, as the old song used to go. We're going from maybe from six to ten or whatever. We're constantly going. But it's amazing how um, when we find something that we really want to do, we somehow or another find a way to rearrange our schedule and fit it in. Now, I don't know whether your favorite thing to do is to fish, to garden, to read, listen to music, whatever it is. But somehow or another, we as human beings have a way of being able to work the things that we really want to do into our schedule. Um, but this, we're like a sponge, again, until we get some of that you know, squeezed out of us, some of the things that we're doing, one of those activities may be moved aside. Because statistics have shown over the years that most people say they are too busy in other areas of life to serve in many aspects of church, and especially in and of making disciples. And yes, everyone is busy, no question about it. I sometimes wonder how I ever got anything done when I was working. Now that I'm retired, it seems like I got less time than I did when I was working. Um, but I haven't completely quit working, so anyway. But, you know, even our kids are busy. Some of these families, the, the, one of the family members or somebody turns to be a bus driver. Uh, there's kids in soccer and cheerleading and band and debate and dance and karate and everything else. So sometimes, you know, mothers end up going all over the world trying to deliver their kids to various places. The problem is in our hearts because making disciples is just not as important or as valuable to us as X. You fill in the, you fill in the blank. But when we increase the value of some activity, whatever it may be, as I said earlier, we find a way to fit it in. We need to be able to, as individuals, identify what our gifts, what our talents are, and what we would really like to do, and then take the initiative, go about in doing it. I think we all know, I think we all understand, that in spite of the fact that what Christ said to go and make disciples, he did not specifically say anything about church attendance. He didn't say in that thing that church attendance. Now, we know there are other scriptures that talk about church attendance, and I'm not in any way diminishing the importance of church attendance because it is very important. But as Christ told Peter, remember, three different times he said what? Feed my sheep. Feed my lambs. And that was basically talking to the people that were in his bailiwick that he was working with. If you'll think about it too, a large majority of the New Testament is written specifically to congregations and or elders about teaching. Look in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 2. The first thing it says is, unto the church of God which is at Corinth. Okay, this is being written to the church. It's not being written to one specific person. It's being written to the church. It goes on to say then, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints. Us, to them that are sanctified, simply means set apart, those that are called to be 
by Christ Jesus to be saints. Saints are those who have been set aside. Additional clarification comes to me in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 5 when Paul says, Who then is Paul? Or who is Apollo? But he says they are ministers, or he could have said they are servants, whom you have believed, even as the Lord gave to every man. He didn't say he only gave to Matthew and Mark and Luke and John and Paul and right on down the line. He said to every man. I've planted, Apollos watered, but it is God that gave the increase. Now he that plants and he that waters are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. My reward will not be because of your labor, and your reward will not be because of my labor. Our reward will be strictly because of what we have done individually to serve and to fulfill his calling to him. For we are laborers together with God. You know, when you're standing out in the field, some of you may be gardeners, hot, sweaty in June, July, and August. You know, you're laboring. You know what it's labor to sweat and everything else. But this tells us that when we are laboring, we're laboring together with God there by our side. You are God's husbandry. You are God's building. And according to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I've laid the foundation, and another builds thereon. But let every man, every man, take heed how he builds thereupon. That doesn't exclude anyone. It includes everyone. Because we all have talents and abilities. God, as I said earlier, and I'll repeat it again, he did not call, call us just to save us. He called us to use us to fulfill His will, to fulfill His work. But let every man take heed how he builds thereupon. Now the one thing we can't control is the increase. God gives the increase. But we can control how we individually are laboring or building, as Paul expressed it there, what we're doing. And as I said, a disciple simply means one who is a learner. It simply means one who is a pupil or a follower. It's no big deal to a, a you know, disciple. But we are the sowers. We are the, the waterers. It is our responsibility to, to reap the harvest as God gives that increase. Where is that going to come from? Family? Friends? Neighbors? Co-workers? Ad infinitum. Wherever you are, wherever you go. I have said for the longest of time, and I wasn't the first to say it, and I won't be the last to say it, the most effective sermon ever given is the way that we lead our life. And the people that see that life that we lead and want to have a part in it, they want to have a part with that, they want to have what you have. The Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 58, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be you steadfast, unmovable, but always abounding in the work of the Lord. Always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. If we are doing work for God, it's not going to be in vain. Are we going to see, like, have you ever planted something and just watched and waited and waited for it to finally stuck up out of the ground? I planted part of my garden a couple of weeks ago and some of it has not come up. It hadn't been good, the rain and everything else. I think everything's rotting in the ground. But God will give the increase. We don't have to worry about that. God will give the increase. And our labor will not be in vain. We've all got to seek to discover, then to embrace and fully develop whatever gifts that we have been receiving, whatever God has given to us, and then with our labor, we will produce, but it will not be in vain. We will not come away empty-handed. Remember Philippians chapter 4 and verse 13, where it says, I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. Now, did that say I, I can only do X, Y, Z? No, I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. And I think 
we all want to hear at some point in time in our life those words in Matthew chapter 25 and verse 21 where he said, Well done, you good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. And then he goes on to say, Enter you therefore into the joy of your Lord. If we do our work, if we're good at it, we're faithful at it, we will be made a ruler over many things. Now, at the same time, I think when any of us approach something new, and for many, working with other people and making disciples is somewhat new. I think we sometimes approach it with a certain amount of trepidation. You know, can we do this? A certain amount of uncertainty um, of not knowing how to do it. But we'll never find out if we don't try it. But the God's answer is, can you do this? Absolutely. For he said he will always be with us and we can always do everything through Christ who strengthens us. Not just some things, but all the things that he has called us to do and to be a part. He would not call us if he did not need us and want us to do something. My, my papers are stuck together here on my notes. But especially, and I believe, as I said, with such an important and clear instruction as we were given back in Matthew and I think, again, it is the prime directive to us as individual Christians to go and make disciples. I took a few scriptures, the gist of them, and wrote something here. I said, here's what I want to hear God say to me when that day comes. You have abounded in the work I have given you. You have taken risks. You have dreamed dreams, and you have exercised the gifts that I gave you. You rolled up your sleeves, and you worked and sometimes you even sacrificed and poured yourself out like a drink offering. So as we leave here today, we need to all ask God for the strength to follow the directions that he's given to us, that our Lord and Master has shown us, that he wants us to do, to you and me, to go and make disciples of all nations, to baptize them, to teach them to obey everything that I have commanded you. Just as he said back in Matthew so, go make disciples.